All right, so this support workshop was inspired by a uh, support question about how to deploy to Docker Swarm. And one of the um, outcomes of that is that uh, working with Docker images is a little bit different conceptually than working with regular packages, uh, just because of the nature of how Docker actually packages things up and how the tools that use it typically uh, consume those packages. Um, so to start with, I wanted to uh, dive in a little bit into what a Docker image actually is. Um, and hopefully that will shed some light on uh, the differences in how these, uh, these tools actually work with the images and how um, Octopus itself works with the images. Uh, so the, probably the big difference, uh, the, well, the most obvious difference when you're deploying is that, say if you're deploying a, a .NET app to IIS, for example, um, the, the app you'll be deploying is actually a, it's either a zip file or a new package uh, file. And that archive is either stored in Octopus itself or off on a, uh, an external registry. And then Octopus will, um, will download that file, send it off to the target, extract it, manipulate it, uh, potentially package it back up again, and then, um, then actually deploy the app. And so that's how all, all our steps work. So that's, you know, .NET or Java or any of the deploy package steps that we have all kind of follow that same model. Uh, Docker is a little bit different because uh, the, the Docker images themselves weren't really designed to be manipulated. Um, the, I mean, all your other application packages are typically zip files. There's a lot of tools and libraries out there that we can lean on to um, you know, extract them and pack them and verify them and whatnot. Docker images are a little bit different. They're, they were never really designed from the beginning to be uh, downloaded locally uh, or extracted or, or repacked. Um, the tooling, there is some tooling that exists today that let us do this, uh, but it is, it is quite specialized. And it's quite a, an odd task to do, to be uh, downloading and uh, extracting files. But I can show you how, to, how uh, some of these third party tools do it. So we have, uh, I've grabbed two tools here. Uh, this one here called Scopio. Uh, and this is a tool I believe written by Red Hat that allows you to kind of uh, download or move images around between registries. And uh, so this is a, a third party uh, tool that has been built and maintained outside of the main Docker uh, pipeline or tool set. And likewise, this one here, uh, I don't actually know how to pronounce this. I know I'll pronounce it wrong. I think it's, I mean, it's spelt like Umoki, but uh, I think it's Omoshi or something. That's the actual pronounce in the Omochi. Anyway, so this, uh, this is another third party tool that um, will take the uh, images that are downloaded by something like Scopio and then uh, extract them out onto the disk. So you can actually see the, uh, the, the resulting files that Docker would use. Uh, so these are, these are very handy tools, but um, they've kind of been developed outside of uh, Docker to uh, solve, um, you know, the, the, the needs of these various third party uh, developers. And um, this is, this kind of signals to you that uh, the process that we're doing here of downloading and extracting files is is still specialized. It's not something a lot of people would end up doing in their day-to-day -day workflow. Uh, so if we do Scopio copy, so what this is gonna do is grab, in this case, the Nginx image and uh, download it to my local uh, file system under the Nginx directory. And so what we end up as a result of this is uh, an OCI bundle, uh, which is really just a uh, basically the, the Docker image artifact um, downloaded locally. And so these are the two layers being downloaded from uh, the two or the couple of layers that make up that uh, Nginx image. If we go into Nginx here, we go into blobs. So we can see here that uh, a Docker image, the the files in the Docker image are actually made up of a number of different layers. Uh, and these layers are just uh, tar files. Uh, 
So I've just done a directory listing of one of those, those uh, layers. And these are the files that make up the, uh, the layer or one of the layers of the Docker image. And so what the way Docker works is that you have multiple layers and they, they kind of extract over one another to build up the final result. Uh, there is some magic in there to also uh, include deletes in, in a top level layer. So a top level layer can actually go ahead and, and delete one of these files and it won't show up in the, uh, the final end result. Uh, so there is, um, even though these files are fairly standard files, they're just JSON or, or tar, you do have to be careful when working with them because there is some, uh, you know, uh, there is some specialized processing in there to, to recombine these all into the final end result. Uh, to get that final end result though, we'll just use uh, Emoshi here. What that's going to do is actually unpack the... Um, uh, the, the layers that uh, have been saved into this nginx directory by Scopio and uh, extract the final result into the directory called nginx bundle. So if you look in there, we have a uh, file system. And this is essentially what uh, the end result of the uh, combination of those layers taking into account any deletes or other specialized processing that needs to go on. So it is, uh, it is definitely possible to download and extract and work with Docker images and repack the result, but it is not, uh, it's not a typical workflow. The tools to do it aren't, um, they're, they're quite specialized. So by that, I mean, they're all written in Go. Uh, there's no kind of generalized libraries that I've ever found that allow you to do this sort of work in other languages like uh, C Sharp or, or Java or whatever. And so for us to incorporate this kind of logic would be a fair bit of uh, engineering effort to, um, to be able to, to replicate the kind of workflow that we do with zip files or new package files. Right, so all of this is really just a long-winded way of saying that uh, Octopus is not really typically going to download Docker images. Um, the tools that consume Docker images uh, almost always understand how to get that Docker image from a registry themselves. And um, they quite often expect just the image name. They don't expect the actual uh, Docker image to be downloaded and uh, presented to them. They'll go off and get them by themselves. So uh, what this means is that when you're working with tools like uh, Docker Compose, for example, uh, so Docker Compose is just a, um, it's a tool, and this is one of the, uh, the official Docker developed tools. And it's a tool that uh, reads a config file. And in this case, it's just, uh, it's just this kind of YAML file here to uh, build up a collection of uh, Docker images into a kind of a, complete holistic stack. And so one of the examples that I've pulled off the website here was the, the stack to build up WordPress, which is made up of both the, uh, the WordPress image and um, a database, uh, MySQL in this case, and the combination of these two uh, give you a, a working application. Uh, and so this YAML file here describes the, how these two are configured and how they work together. Um, this same, our uh, file here also works with Docker Swarm. Uh, Docker Swarm was a competitor to Kubernetes. Uh, I mean, to be honest, it kind of lost that battle and it's not as popular these days. Um, every cloud provider has a Kubernetes service. I don't actually know of any that have a, a managed Docker Swarm service, certainly not a native one anyway. But uh, it, it has come up in support tickets, people trying to deploy the Docker Swarm, so it is still being used. So what we need to do then is uh, give people the ability to deploy to these services like uh, the Docker Compose or Docker Swarm, maintaining the ability to select new versions of their Docker images with each deployment, but then uh, passing that information down to the individual tool, which really just expects a uh, a text string, the name of the image that it will then go off and uh, download for itself and, and manage with its own internal process. So the way we do this in uh, Octopus is through these reference packages. 
So I have that fade here, I'll just open that up. So if we look at external feeds, I've just set up a Docker Hub external feed here. And these two external packages, oh sorry, reference packages are um, linking off to both MySQL and WordPress. And uh, we're setting these to be not be acquired. So what this means is that Octopus will expose the packages in the same way that it does with any other package in the create release process, but it won't ever actually try and download or do anything with the package. It's, uh, it is essentially just um, at this point, it just becomes a variable in the variable list that we can consume in our steps. Uh, so the, if you look at the documentation, uh, sorry, this documentation actually comes from this link here. You can see that uh, we list a whole bunch of the, uh, the variables that will be contributed uh, once you add a reference package. Uh, this list is actually not uh, exhaustive though. Uh, different feed types can actually contribute additional uh, properties on the end of these, uh, the base variable name. And in the case of Docker, there's actually two. Uh, well, there's actually, I think there's two, yeah. And um, one of them is this dot .image uh, property here. And so what this is, is the full, fully qualified uh, Docker image reference, which includes the name of the, of the Docker image and also the host name of the uh, registry that, um, that where it can be downloaded from. And so what I've done here is just created up the, the YAML that uh, Docker Compose would expect and where it references an image, and so normally this would be something like MySQL latest, for example, we've actually replaced that with the, uh, the variable that Octopus will provide um, that includes the details of the package that was selected during the create release. And so if I go ahead and actually create this release, you can see here that we've given, we've gain the ability to select these packages just like we would any other package. Um, they can be put into channel rules. They can be, yeah, they can be used basically in any other way that a, a normal package would. Um, the exception being obviously that because we've set them to not be acquired, they just won't be downloaded. They exist really just to contribute those variables. So I'll go ahead and deploy this. I'm not actually gonna run Docker Compose here. I just wanted to show how, uh, how someone would use this in in a real world example. Uh, and actually what I should do is uh, show the, show all the variables that can get contributed. Oh, I am, okay, that's good. Right, so here we can see the, um, the variables that have been contributed for these uh, reference packages. These were the standard ones, extract package ID, well, package version. Uh, image, this is that additional one, and that's the, the fully qualified Docker image there. Uh, there's a few others there, like a uh, registry that, that give you some additional information about where the, uh, the Docker image came from. If we look down here, we can see that the end result of our variable substitution has been a YAML file with the, uh, the the Docker images that we selected and more importantly, their versions have been replaced. And so in this way, you can interact with, um, with any tool really that uh, has, that expects a uh, Docker image to be passed in either through a config file or maybe on the command line and um, integrate that into the usual uh, create release and package selection workflow that, uh, that every other deployment style or every other deployment project in Octopus uh, uses as well. Uh, so that's a generic script step. So that will capture, I mean, that's the, anything you can script up can be run on that. There's a more specialized use case here with the Kubernetes YAML. And so this script step uh, allows you to deploy uh, basically raw YAML, uh, any, any valid Kubernetes YAML uh, resource definition can be put in here. And this is useful for cases where 
our more specialized steps like this one. So this one here. So while this step does expose quite a lot of settings, it, uh, it doesn't expose them all and probably will never. We'll always, there'll always be some setting that we haven't exposed in here. And so if you ever reach a point of this step not being complete enough for you to use, uh, or you just actually prefer to work with, with YAML, then, uh, then we recommend people fall back to this step. And it has the same logic here. So if we look in, in the YAML editor, again, I've replaced the image field here with that, that same uh, variable that gets contributed. And uh, it too has this list of reference packages. Uh, the difference between the YAML step and the script step though, is that the YAML step knows you're only ever gonna be selecting uh, Docker images um, this package feed will only ever show Docker feeds and no, you'll notice that you don't get the option to either um, uh, acquire or not acquire. It's just assumed that everything is not acquired and we're only using these packages as, or these images I should say, as a way of contributing those variables. So the, the pop-up here is a little bit simpler. And uh, again, if we have a look at the actual deployment, uh, we can see that the end result was what we expect uh, if I look down here. Right, so it's gone through and uh, replaced that uh, variable placeholder with the, uh, the Docker image that we selected during deployment, which would be uh, this one here. Yeah, uh, so that's it. This is a fairly quick workshop, but uh, I just wanted to highlight how um, they can use these additional package references as a way of getting those Docker image strings into either uh, config files that you build up in a script step or into uh, YAML files that uh, you build with the deploy raw Kubernetes YAML step. So did you have any questions or is there anything you want to go into? Um, I just had one question that I think I got a little confused on. Yep. So that um, you're referencing the package here, which you referenced in, in the library. So it's, it's in the uh, built-in repo. No, right? no, this, this is not built-in repo. This is a... Uh, on the WordPress and SQL one? Uh, didn't you show... Or was I thinking you're on the wrong page? So there's this one here. These are both from Docker so, as well. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. So I just missed all them. Yeah. You could actually select the built-in feed. Obviously, given it's a script step, we don't know what you're gonna use these packages for. Um, yep. It's just that, yeah, if, if you are referencing them from a Docker feed, you almost always wanna select package will not be acquired because you only want the variables. It doesn't make sense to actually get the package. Yep. Cool. Yeah, I got a little confused because I saw uh, Docker registry in the task log and yeah. Anyway. Right, okay. Oh, good. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, nice and quick one today. Thanks for listening and uh, cool. I'll catch you next time. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. All right. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good one. See ya.